like studying economics. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted you to talk about that because so much students are always saying, oh, but miss, why do, should I learn this? <laughs> why, what's math going to do for me in, in my career? What's economics going to do for me? So that conversation, I mean, I want to have that conversation like, I mean, can you tell us, like, how does geography help you? How does maths help you? And how does economics help you in your current job? Ah, oh, economics is probably the biggest help. And I'll be the first to confess that I found economics a tough subject when I was doing my MBA. Um, especially microeconomics, I had to really go out of my way to understand the subject to the extent that I understood it. Uh, and thankfully, I, I did well. But honestly, when I was studying microeconomics, I actually, at one point, lowered my ambition to please just let me get through this. Just, I cannot fail this subject. It'll be the first time I failed something and I, I just cannot fail this, you know. Um, I'm so thankful that I put in the effort to understand it. So I, I give you the example of economics. One of the principles we use very strongly in telecommunications in determining, determining our revenue outcome for new products and services is elasticity. Elasticity as a principle is an economic um, you know, principle, supply, demand, how people will change their consumption and usage and things around that. But that is actually the, the fundamental principle we use in determining our business cases for new products and ideas. So economics is right there in telecoms, yeah. right? Thank you for saying that because my <laughs> students were watching. That's what I'm teaching you. Learn income elasticity, cross elasticity, price elasticity of demand, price elasticity of supply, because it applies. Everything is <laughs> a, 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 applicable. The marginal cost for the marginal revenue, it's in business. So when, when we're looking at this, this new idea where we're going to invest so much, right? Is it a marginal cost or is it a truly fully blown new cost we're about to sink? And if you sink that money in, is, it, is the marginal going to be truly incremental or is it marginally incremental all these things are from economics i didn't read that in an, an engine an engineering book a book i didn't read it in a market it is from economics economic principles in business in telecoms um, you talk about geography which is a subject i absolutely loved in school um, when you're deploying a network actually how you get to deploy you may have your 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 um, engineering principles or how sound propagates or how waves propagate or how you use different frequency to carry frequencies to carry the signals but guess what you need to build a network in a real uh, place on earth right <laughs> which has varying topographies contours buildings high rises look this is all geography so you actually have to apply your principles from geography to how you deploy a network you know um, you go to a hilly country how is that different from a flatland or that you know a city versus a rural area how do you deploy differently um, geography also applies and actually a, a meeting on geography applies when you're thinking about customers so when we think of our customers we think of them in their zones of habitation and where most of their life happens but in those zones of habitation you also have to look at their economic activity and when they have peaks and troughs or troughs in their income streams and what, what you know how their usage habits based on their days of activity and various um, activities so their economic activity actually um, affects your business profitability in a specific location. So geography and economics actually meet when you serve a particular group of customers. Interesting stuff, right? Um, um, what else can I think of? Oh, it, it, it's endless. Every single thing we, we, we do in school is relevant. You talk about um, uh, marketing. And I think we've come to see marketing as um, a lot around communication and because communication seems quote-unquote obvious to most people we think communication is straightforward actually the truest form of marketing is about opening uh, owning a share of mind okay. it's about owning a share of your customers mind that's more in you know, the psychology of a human being in marketing um, than just saying you know I put out a message so when you're you're in that class and you're doing all those um, lessons around psychology and you're thinking oh, what's the point of saying yeah. I don't want to become a psychologist I'm not going to put someone in a chair and start and picking their brain <laughs> you're not but as a marketer you must you absolutely must otherwise you're not getting very far and bear in mind that different groups of people um, think and behave slightly differently their socialization and so many see look at me talking about socialization in business and I'm sure when um, teachers are talking about it in school kids are oh, why do I need to know this <laughs> don't worry I've been there so I can relate to it it's, it's, it's not true 
And that's how I, I progressively built my career in different functional areas, in different countries. I worked in Ghana, I've worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I've worked in Tanzania, I've been to Rwanda, Chad and so on. And that's how over time I've built this career. So all these things in my life have come together um, to, so obviously, as you said, you know, in 2014, I became the first Ghanaian woman to be in charge of a telecommunications company anywhere, including Ghana itself, anywhere at all. And it really hadn't dawned on me the magnitude of what was going to, what, what, what that, that meant. That, that was huge. <laughs> <laughs> of what that meant. But all these steps were in preparation of that, for that, obviously. And I always say to people that it is not about, you know, your gender, your race, your identity. Um, it, it, that becomes part of the story when you actually get there. But the journey of the story is about building the skills, closing the gaps of the things you need to be able to do to get there. So focus on developing yourself, develop your skills and abilities, um, your temperament, your character. Develop those things that you will need to get there because ultimately when you get there, no one's gonna say, oh, what a nice woman she is. No, 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 they're gonna say, can you do the job or not? Have you got what it takes to be, regardless of your background, regardless whether if, if you're from, you know, um, if a housing council is in a city, in a city housing or not, or from a crowd, from Kumasi or wherever, it is about can you do the job? And then you, by being able to do the job, carry all of these things with you. Right, you carry them with you because when people say you can do the job and you get the job, that's when they now say, oh, she's a woman from Ghana. Oh, she's, she's, she's born in this place. So she, those things, you get a voice because you have developed yourself to give them a voice. Wow, wow. <laughs> that is inspirational. So in terms of developing yourself, what would you say is, is, has made the most difference to you in terms of developing yourself to get to where you are right now? Um, Probably the biggest thing is um, faith. I've always, so for me, I didn't immediately grow up as a Christian. Um, in the early days, we didn't really used to go, go to church, but somewhere in my uh, childhood, mid-childhood, um, I, I developed um, faith through the right encouragement, right Christian people being around me, particularly when I moved to Ghana, um, accepting Christ. That faith gives you a confidence and hope sometimes hard to articulate because it's inside of you. Um, I've experienced many, many hardships and, and people, you know, it's not always visible, but many, many hardships. There have been times where, as I've, heard, I've had to sit out school because I couldn't afford to keep going, all these things. Faith keeps you going and faith tells you that, you know what, there's a plan, there's a, there's, you're, you're, you're part of a bigger story. Keep going, don't, don't, don't give up on it. Faith is definitely a big one. Um, the fact that my, my father, had this strong belief in ability and talent and wasn't in your face about it, but was always encouraging about it, was always trying to draw out the best in you and put in challenges in front of me that were very difficult. I mean, I go back to, to school children. My, my father started teaching me algebra when I was like eight years old. Wow. I was thinking, you know, numbers and letters <laughs> don't get mixed. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want me to know this? What he was trying to do was stretch. These things were about stretching. And when I, it came to actually having to do algebra in school, it made it so much easier, much more straightforward. But it's about stretch. So the second thing is around my dad always wanting a stretch. Stretch yourself, go further. Um, the third one is my, my mom is um, a dreamer, absolute. She, she, my mom grew up in, both of my parents grew up in villages in Ghana. They weren't city people. And my mom always tells the story of being in, uh, being a schoolgirl, and every time she would see a plane fly over, she would say, "I'm going to be in a plane one day. Uh, you know, I'm going to go somewhere that a plane takes me." Or she, um, she said, when she was a, a girl, she was she was, she was very frugal, and she always used to save up her money. And she talks about buying. Um, this is really old stuff. I mean, too old. Uh, there was a powder. Uh, um, called Saturday Night or yeah, something. Yeah, Saturday Night. Yeah, yeah. It, ha it has a blue. Um, it's blue. Blue and I've it's got it white. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a picture from a big city. I don't know, New yeah, York, yeah. somewhere, some Western city. Yeah, yeah. And she, she was inspired by Saturday Night nice. powder oh, wow. to say, you know, you yeah, these wonderful places. I'm going to go there one day. Wow. So I have this mom who's always about things that 
had no one, they're not in her world. Remember, she wasn't even in a city, she was in a village. But she had these things that are, all these things that, you know, are going, going, going um, to happen. I, I think these three pillars are very, so very strong for me. And coming together, they gave me this desire and ambition and, and hope for, 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 for great things. And I've seen how they've come from these places of unlikely, like, un unlikely situations. I mean, I, I was, my grandparents didn't speak a word of English. My, my grandparents didn't go to any form or have any form of formal education. Um, and so to be me from them, I, I think every single opportunity which I actualize is a demonstration that potential isn't only real, it can be realized, it can do more than just um, make life okay for the person in question. And that should serve as a, a source of inspiration for all young people for me. So work is important, achievement is important. Um, doing great work means that I can influence the prosperity of, of, of communities and, 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 and nations. Um, but also inspiring that the young people can see and say, you know, it's possible. Where she comes from, if she can do it, look, I come from much better circumstances. I can do far better than her. And I want people to do more uh, and better than anything that I can, I can dream of. I love, to, I'm still dreaming though. <laughs> yeah, because one thing as well is like, you know, when you went to Airtel, you've actually led the company to like win so many awards. Even yourself as well, you won the CIMG award. And I remember like when you won that award, it was so huge because I follow you on social media. So on Facebook, I remember you mentioning the fact that, you know, there were voices that were like, you know, you're not going to be able to make it. And you proved those voices wrong. So my next question is, you know, obviously we've all got goals and dreams and ambitions. And we've always got voices that are like, oh, why are you doing this? You can't do this. So how are you able to shut out all those voices and, and say that it, even though you're saying I can't do it, I think I can, I do, can it. do it. And you actually proved that you could do it. Yeah. So um, I became um, a CEO of Airtel Ghana, third attempt. Not third attempt, but Airtel Ghana third attempt at a CEO job. There's stories around that, which I'll tell you one day, but stories around how I missed the opportunity twice. For good reason. I think as a woman of faith, I believe that those were not the right opportunities for me. But it also meant that, that every single time it didn't happen, it was more training time. When you expect things to happen though, and they don't happen, and a lot of the time I go back and I have a conversation, I pray and I say, God, you know, what, what's going on? You know, I don't understand. And I'll be the first to admit that sometimes in the immediate aftermath, it involves actually feeling quite low, sometimes even crying and saying, oh, this is so upsetting. But you have to be determined that, that, that those periods, of, uh, periods that remind you that you're human, they remind me that in feeling low, yes, I'm, I'm a human being and I need to let those feelings out, but I shouldn't stew in them. So I don't allow myself to continue and have uh, turn into a long winded pity party of how unfortunately this one opportunity didn't work out. Um, so it may last a day maybe sometimes too, but I don't allow it to drag on. And you get back on into your faith, your focus, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, and the work you need to get there. Remember that the person who's saying no to you, they're part of your story too. It is their job to be a blocker for now to something much greater. Don't let that voice become the voice because the voice said no. That voice's no is probably a required no, but a short-term no. It is, it is not your voice of determination and aspiration and, and hope for the future. That's not the purpose of that voice. So determine that you have to understand when you're listening to, and when I say voices, I don't mean crazy stuff. I mean people actually speaking to you. What is the purpose of that voice? Because that will just help you recognize whose voice do you listen to yeah. in that yeah. situation. Yeah. Because the call that you use, you're always saying that descend the voice, that's for you. Yeah, it's something I learned from yes. you. You always say discern. I'm like, that's a very powerful statement. You must be discerning. Mm -hmm. um, that voice may be there for, for, for now, but it's not the voice of, the, of your long-term future. And so I always reminded myself that, you know, we're on, a, we're on a mission. There's a vision. There's a plan. You know in your heart what you're capable of and what you're going to do and what you're going to achieve and attain. So keep at it. Don't, don't stop now. And, and, and ultimately, what I've learned from this experience is that 
when I actually got to become CEO of Airtel Ghana, it was a much bigger opportunity than any of the other opportunities that had gone by. And I tell you why. It gave me the, the platform on, 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 uh, to, to actually do a lot more of the things that I aspired to do than any of the, the opportunities that passed me by would have. Amazingly, I have had the opportunity to inspire an organization. I've had an opportunity to see young people grow in their potential. I have, I have an amazing team of people at Airtel who are inspired and driven, who are um, focused on their customers in ways that are unusual and the unusual, the, the unusual nature of it has led us to innovate in ways that people go, how did you guys do that? We did it because every person who works in, um, at Airtel Ghana, every single one of those young p p people is someone I look at and I see myself in. And is someone who I say, you have got what it takes, give me what you've got. I don't say to them, I have all the ideas and, uh, and everything, I know everything we're going to do. I, said, I, sh I say to them, show me you, show me what, what's in there, what you can deliver. And because of that, they're able to do even much more than they can imagine themselves, right? It also means that as an organization, we go out there and we reach out to customers. Yes, we do see CSR activities, but we go beyond that. We do activities that actually change the way the communities you know, interact with our services because CSR is charitable and it's um, it's a responsibility but business can even go beyond that to influence positively how people live their lives if I bring you a service that in, makes your business more effective it's probably more useful to you than me just handing you some money to, to invest in your business because I'm bringing you technology that, that can influence your business. So I work for an inspired organization of people and because of that, because of the power of all these hundreds of people out there in the market with the, with the, with, with the people, um, it's been recognized by the country. Um, the, the, the CIMG Marketing Woman of the Year is, is awarded to a businesswoman who has made a transformational, significant difference to her business that has impacted the whole country. And it's not just about telecommunications, it's about business as a whole in Ghana. Um, it was an unexpected, life-changing experience for me. Um, I, I couldn't have imagined what was to follow that award. Um, that the, the ripple effect, the positive ripple effect of that award has been phenomenal. Yeah, and an inspiration for us all, because I know when you won it, I was like, if Lucy can do it, like the sky's the limit. Like, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, Absolutely. it was huge for all of us. Huge. Thanks. Thank you. So, so it's been an inspiration. I've, I've also used it as a platform. So it was a platform on which I launched my um, engagement with schools. So again, I went back to the drawing board and my teams and said, what do we do with this? We win such a huge award. It has to serve more um, of a purpose than being a, you know, uh, a plaque or uh, a, a, a trophy or, um, uh, in my office. It has to do more. So we came up with um, initiative, an initiative that we call um, Evolve with STEM. STEM because my background obviously is engi in engineering, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. I love these subjects. Um, STEM because we, I believe that when you look at the context of, of Africa or any community in the world that needs to develop, where we are today, those who are behind versus those who are ahead of the pack, there's, there's, there's a re actually a really big, a big gap. And I believe STEM provides an opportunity to accelerate the closure of the gap. If we just carry on doing things manually, um, look at this interview, you're going to put it out there and because of technology, hopefully lots of people are going to get to watch this and when they watch it, they're going to share it with other people and tell them about it. And the message of, of being um, inspiring people to do and um, be greater is going to get to hundreds, thousands, even more of people because technology is allowing us to do that. So I believe that STEM has a great role to play in accelerating our development. So we launched the platform um, and I've gone into schools, different schools. I, I typically go to schools um, where children are more disadvantaged um, and I do two main things. One is I've got to tell them to dream. You, 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 
you know, I'm, I, I, the, you have to dream. <laughs> dream bigger, expect more, and get involved in STEM. Not because you have to become a doctor or an engineer. You may not, I became an engineer, you may not become that. But because whatever profession you end up in, STEM is going to make you that much more efficient, effective, um, your your ability, your problem solving abilities, you know, that, that, that math you're doing in school will teach you how to break a problem down into the, the you know, the constituent parts, the drivers of the pro problem. You know, it's like having a, a, an equation in maths, right? This side of the equation gives you something on the outside and sometimes this side is just an answer. If you reverse it and this is actually the problem you're trying to solve, then you're, you're reversing your math to say, what are the steps and the operations and the numbers that I need to work out to, to, to solve this problem? It's pretty much the same principle. So that's the idea of you know, encouraging more and more children into STEM to say, it, it matters, it will make you much more effective in what you choose to do. And if you can use STEM in what you do, you will actually drive more change and development and growth quicker in ways that we need. So um, I've been to, I've actually had so far been able to meet thousands of children, thousands, which is, you know, it's still mind boggling how when we take an advantage of opportunities, it just, it goes so far, thousands of children. I've managed to so far be in, I've gone to four different um, regions in, in the um, country and we're still going with Evolve with STEM. But what's even more remarkable, completely unexpected, is that so many people have now used this as um, inspiration to launch their own initiatives around STEM. Wow, wow. So someone can write to me and say, I'm in such and such village, there was no STEM activity in, in the school, so I started a STEM club, or I started a science club, or I started a coding club, and people are doing all these things. And there were few people who were doing them before, but once I, I made this a, a big agenda that has national and actually now international visibility, People are taking inspiration and going ahead and, and, and launching their own. That for me is, is a, a much greater reward because you know single-handedly I have physical human limits to how many people I can reach. Technology helps me reach more. But if we could get hundreds, thousands of people out there inspired to do similarly relevant to the context they're in, imagine how many children we're going to you know, impact positively. That's a powerful story. There's something I wanted to ask you as well. Like When I did a lot of research about you, it talks about your transformational leadership skills and also about your ability to, like, when it comes to strategy. And I remember listening to an interview once where you said that when you went to Airtel, you didn't go there to impose. You actually went there to actually sit down, talk to different people within the organization. You said you locked yourself into a room after you'd actually got that research. And then basically from that, you developed a strategy to get Airtel to where it is right now. Can you sort of like talk us through the process? Like, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, how do you inspire your team in terms of strategy to be able to, because I realize that with you, it's not about like imposing on what your team should do. You actually work alongside them to get them to where they are. Cool. <laughs>